we have this section in Romans that is uh, looking at this great conflict. And we were asking last class, who is this referring to? Is this referring to Paul? Yes. Is this referring to Paul as a Christian or a non-Christian? We said as a Christian. Is this referring to Paul as a new Christian or as a mature Christian? And I would conclude that it is referring to Paul as a mature Christian. Now, there are four lessons that I want us to note, and they're important lessons that we, uh, that we get from this chapter. And the first is this, that justification are, is not by keeping the, the law, neither is sanctification. Neither is sanctification. Now, why do I say that? What happens when we are first, when we are first saved? There is often a, a great enthusiasm that comes with a desire to uh, live for the Lord, a, a newness in the Christian life. Uh, we, are, we are rejoicing in the fact that we are children of God. Um, and all we see is that joy and enthusiasm. But as we begin to study the Word, read the Word, grow in our Christian lives, seek seriously to live for the Lord, we become a conscious of our own failures. We see that we are not living the way we should. Now, what do you do when you see that? The tendency, the tendency when we see that is to try harder. We will make rules for ourselves. We will make resolutions. We will try uh, to, to uh, become more serious about godly living. And so our solution is to try harder. Now, Paul is saying that that is not the key to sanctification. It is not by trying harder. Just as justification is not by keeping the law, neither is sanctification by keeping the law. Here, I want to make a comment about this whole, this whole process. As I said, we often become aware of our sinfulness as we get into the Christian life more and more. And I think that is really the answer. Remember how we were listing the, the arguments why some were saying this must be a non-Christian because it says in 7.14, uh, the law is spiritual, I am carnal, sold under sin. How could that describe a, a, a genuine believer? Or verses 18 and 19, I know that nothing good dwells in me. Uh, the wishing is present, the doing of the good is not. Uh, I practice the very evil that I do not wish to do. Verse 24, O miserable man that I am. How could that describe a genuine Christian? Especially when Paul has said in chapter 6, we died to sin, we've been set free from the bondage of sin. How can this describe a genuine Christian? Well, remember, go back to chapter 6. What did we say? Chapter 6, when it says that we died to sin, is describing every true believer. It's not describing those who are more spiritual Christians as opposed to less spiritual Christians. When it says we died to sin, in what sense did we die to sin? Do you remember? It is judicial. It is judicial. We are put in Christ. We are in Him. And uh, when God, because we are in Him, when God sees us, he sees us as in Christ, and what happened to Christ happened to us. What we have in, in, in Romans 6 does not eradicate sin in our lives. It does not eradicate our sin nature. 
and it does not diminish the power of sin. We still have a sin nature. It is deceitful. It is very powerful. Now, we have a new master, but that old master is crying out and trying to get us to obey him. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit, and that means that there is going to be spiritual fruit and godliness, but we still have the old nature. And the more we are serious about spiritual things, the more that we are going to be frustrated that we are not all that we should be. The more that we are going to cry out, oh, miserable man that I am, the more we're serious, really, about being godly. If we're not serious about being godly, we're not, you're, you're never going to hear that cry from us. Uh, you're never going to see that sense of frustration, the good that I would do, uh, I do not do. If you know that you have a bad temper uh, and, uh, and one day you just lose it, you get home that night and what do you say to yourself? Don't you say, how could I do that? Isn't that the kind of frustration that we see here in this, in this chapter? This is the frustration of a person that really wants to live a, a godly life. And uh, it is in keeping with what he has been saying in chapter 6 and 7. Now, our first point, sanctification is not by keeping the law. It is not by making rules. It is not by trying harder. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson, the Christian life is a continual conflict. As long as we have our old nature, a sinful nature, we are going to have this conflict. The non-Christian, many non-Christians are not going to sense this conflict at all. Look at the non-Christians. They often delight in their sin. Now, they may not enjoy the consequences of sin. They often don't like the results of sin because the results of sin are death. We saw that in chapter 6, and those are nasty results. But very often, the non-Christian does delight in his sin. And so, uh, as long as we are here in the flesh, until we are glorified, we are going to have this conflict. That's the second lesson. The third lesson, or the second lesson is that the, continuous life, the Christian life is a continuous conflict. The third lesson is that there will always be this conflict. What I'm saying there is in reference to some of the higher life movement Christians. You can never get out of Romans 7 into Romans 8. You can never leave Romans 7 behind so that you are no longer experiencing this conflict. We are still carnal. Sin is still a power in our lives. If you try to take a perfectionist viewpoint, perfectionists say, I stop sinning. If you are going to say that the victorious Christian life means that you get out of Romans 7 into Romans 8 and you don't experience that conflict anymore, then I think that you're just deceiving yourself and keeping yourself from the true means of victory. So, um, you'll always have the conflict. Now, what did Christ, how, did, how did Christ summarize the law? Yep, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, 
Do you love the Lord with all your heart? Do you? I remember when I was first saved, and that question was asked in our high school young people's group. Somebody, how many of you, do you love the Lord with all your heart? My hand shut up. I do. I was newly saved. This was, I love the Lord, okay? And I looked around, and I was the only one with a hand up. Uh, because some others had been taught a little better than I had been taught, and they realized, yes. Did they love the Lord? Yes, they did. With all the heart, soul, mind, and strength? No. No. And uh, the more that you realize that you do not love the Lord with all your heart and you do not love your neighbor as yourself, that will produce frustration and conflict. Lord, you know, how old are you all? Most of you are around 20, right? And uh, I have been a Christian for 50 years. 50 years. You know one of the things that frustrates me? I thought <laughs> that 50 years down the road, I would really be a spiritual giant. <laughs> I thought that I would be much further along. And it does frustrate me to see some of the sins that continually afflict me in my life. So, you're not going to get out of Romans 7 and into Romans 8. You're always going to have this conflict. You need to realize that. You need to realize that. That's, that's important for having a true assessment of what, you, what your Christian life is and should be like. Now, fourth point. Fourth point. There is victory for the Christian. There is victory for the Christian. Sometimes this chapter is read as if there is only continual defeat. The good that I would do, I do not do. The evil that I don't want to do, I do. Some pe people just summarize the, the whole chapter that way. That's not the way Paul summarizes it. He says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is victory. And then in summarizing it up, he says there is defeat and there is victory. And that both of those continue. Now, where's the victory? Thanks be to God through, huh? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The victory is in Him. We are not able to overcome our flesh, our old nature, but Christ is. And He does give us victory. How does He give us victory? We've got to go to the next chapter. What a transition. That is the transition to our next chapter, Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8 says that he gives us the victory through the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And so, when you look at your Christian life, when you think of the Christian life, you need to think in both, in terms of both Romans 7 and Romans 8. The struggle in Romans 7 and the victory through the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. Now, if you have that attitude, you will not be saying, as in chapter 6 and verse 1, shall we continue in sin? You won't be saying that. There will be a desire for godliness. There will be a desire for for living in a way that is pl pleasing to the, to the Lord. Okay? Are there any questions? We got, we're going into Romans 8. Now, this is one of the 
greatest chapters in the Bible. I've said sometimes this is my favorite chapter in the Bible, but I think I'm like James Boyce, who uh, was, was uh, announcing in his series on Romans that he's going to start preaching on uh, Romans 8, his favorite chapter in the Bible. And uh, somebody came up and uh, brought up with his, uh, brought up to him his, his commentary on the minor prophets. And I think it was in the book of Hosea. And he says, he says uh, Dr. Boyce, do you notice what you said here? I think you said this chapter in one of the minor prophets was your favorite chapter in the Bible. Uh, this is a great chapter. Many Christians have looked upon this chapter as their favorite chapter chapter in the Bible. Many people look at Romans 8 as the, uh, as the central chapter of, of, of the Bible. Um, one commentator said, if scripture is a ring and Romans is the precious stone in the ring, then Romans 8 is the sparkle in the stone. And there are a couple of other uh, uh, comments like that. If Romans is the holy place in the tabernacle, then Romans 8 is the holy of holies. Do you know what they're saying? I like Romans 8. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Now, Paul has described the Christian as the person who is justified by faith. Now he is going to describe the Christian life as the life of the believer who is indwelt by the by the Holy Spirit. This is a great chapter on the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the Holy Spirit correctly, the way Scripture looks upon the Holy Spirit, you will look at the Holy Spirit as a person, a person who is indwelling you, and you will not look at the Holy Spirit just as a force a power that is in you, enabling you to live for God. It is a person who is in you, the Holy Spirit. Now, how can we have victory over sin? How can we have victory over sin? How can we have that victory that we have in chapter 7 and verse, and verse 25? There are some striking things that are immediately obvious when you compare Romans 7 with Romans 8. First of all, the words I, me, and my occur 49 times in our English Bible. I'm counting the New American Standard uh, version there. 49 times you have the words I, me, and my. In chapter 8, you have those words two times. Two times. Okay? Secondly, in chapter 7, there is one reference to the Holy Spirit. Once. In chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is referred to 21 times. Once in seven, 21 in eight. In chapter seven, the law is mentioned 23 times. In chapter eight, the law is mentioned five times. And not all of those five times are referring to the to the actual Old Testament law, they may be refer some of them may be referring to the principle uh, of something, the law of the spirit of life, the principle. Uh, so, what's the difference between Romans 7 and Romans 8? You see that? There are certain things that are obvious. Romans 7 is all about me. Romans 7 is all about me. Romans 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. Romans 7 is the struggle. 
the struggle to keep the law, the struggle to please God. But it's all about me, my struggle, in my own strength, trying to keep the law. We have become child, children of God. We have a new nature. But my new nature does not have enough strength in, its, in itself to overcome sin and to please God. If there is going to be victory over sin, it is going to have to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so God has given us the Holy Spirit in order for us to overcome sin in our lives and in order for us to please Him. When Paul says in chapter 7 and verse 24, who will deliver me? And then he says, Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ delivers us, but he does that through the Holy Spirit that he has sent to work in us. Say, so Christ delivers us through his Spirit. What's the connecting word in chapter 8 and verse 1? Therefore. Therefore. You're making an inference, right? Now, when you see a word like that, what is the logical connection? This is a conclusion uh, based upon something that is preceded. Now, what have we just, what have we just had, had preceding? Now, he says in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you look at the Greek text, the emphasis is on that word, no. It's the literally none. <laughs> That's the first word in the verse. None. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But that's the conclusion of what? Now, what have we just had in verses 14 to 25? You see a, a struggle there in the, in, the, in the Christian life. And we have this struggle wanting to do good and not doing it and not wanting to do evil and doing it to say there is therefore no condemnation. That really doesn't follow from the struggle that we have had there in, in chapter, in chapter uh, 7 and, and uh, verses 14 to, uh, to 21. Now, what Paul seems to be doing here in, uh, in chapter 8 with this word therefore is going back to chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. What he has done in chapter, chapter uh, 7 and verses 7 and following is answer objections or questions that really relate to the law. And so now he is going to go back to, uh, to chapter 6, where he said, and chapter 7, in chapter 6, he says that we uh, died to sin in order that we might walk in newness of life. And he has said that we are married to Christ in order that we might bear fruit to God. Now, um, he is going to say to us in chapter 8 that uh, we have a new power within us to live to God and to bear fruit to God. And that is why uh, there is now, and because of this, not that is why, but because of this, there is no condemnation. Because of what has happened to us in our relationship to Christ, there is now no condemnation. Now, this is a tremendous statement. No condemnation. Absolutely none. 
Is that good news? Is that good news? Now that is not just good news for you as a sinner who needs to have salvation. That is good news for you as a Christian who has experienced the struggle of chapter 7. Uh, that statement, that statement for you as a Christian will not mean that much if you are not burdened by sin. But if you are disappointed in your Christian life with your inability to really please God, and if you are burdened by your sins as a Christian, this is wonderful news. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, yes, I, I accepted Christ. My sins were forgiven. But how can God put up with me when I continue to fail him so often? <laughs> you see what Paul says right off the bat? Hey, Christian, there's no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that does not rule out God's discipline in your life. You remember the book of Hebrews says that if you are a child of God, God's going to discipline you. And it does not say that there is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. We, the, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But there's no condemnation. There's no punishment. The judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a judgment of punishment. It is going to be a judgment for rewards. But there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know why? Why? Why is there no condemnation for us? Because Christ bore our condemnation. Our condemnation was laid on him. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. So, when you read this verse, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a tremendous verse. Now, that also means when Paul says, who will deliver me? There is deliverance. There is victory through Christ. But remember that the only sins that we can have victory over are forgiven sins. You get that? I love that truth. John Piper emphasizes that truth all the time. The only sins that we can have victory over are forgiven sins. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You notice that in the New King James and the, or the King James and the New King James, this verse does not end with a statement, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, what you have here is not really a question of translation. What you have here is a question of textual criticism. The earliest manuscripts that we have of the New Testament are like the New American Standard. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, there are Manuscripts, particularly the manuscripts from the Middle Ages that have this extra statement, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, think about that. What is the ground, what is the basis for no condemnation? In the New American Standard, what's the basis for our no condemnation? Christ Jesus, for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the King James and the New King James, what is the ground 
for no condemnation. Huh? Yeah, and walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, what is the basis for no condemnation? It is not our walk which is the basis for no condemnation. If our walk is the basis for no condemnation, we're in trouble, right? We're in trouble. It is simply on the basis of being in Christ Jesus because his work is sufficient. Now, where does this extra phrase come from that is found in the King James and the New King James? Does anybody know? Does anybody know? Look at verse 4, where Paul says, in order that the re righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the, to the Spirit. In verse 4, those words are found in the text, and they are descriptive of a Christian. They're not describing what makes a Christian, but they are describing what a Christian looks like. Now, how did those verbs, those, that, that phrase from verse 4 get to verse 1? There's a note in the Net Bible that says, scribes were evidently motivated to add this phrase, to add this qualification from verse 4 to insulate Paul's gospel from the charge that it was characterized by too much grace. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You remember what objection that led to at the end of chapter 5? The more sin, the more grace. Therefore, Why don't we just keep sinning in order that grace might abound? And so that is the fear. That is the fear, the fear of antinomianism. And it was probably this fear that caused scribes to transfer that phrase from verse 4, where it has a different meaning, to verse 1, where it really becomes a problematic verse. Now, it is possible to understand uh, I have friends that, uh, that uh, support the King James and the New King James, and it's possible to understand that as a description of a Christian, not the uh, basis uh, for, having, for the one who has no condemnation. But I think that that is, uh, that is um, uh, a mistake there. This is a tremendous verse. This is a verse to rejoice in. There's no condemnation, no condemnation, none whatsoever. Why? Because of Christ, because of Christ. And it really focuses on the fact that all of the glory goes to him. Now, you notice when Paul says that there is no condemnation, it is for those who are, what? In Christ. All humanity is divided into two groups. Those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. And those who are in Christ are not condemned. But those who are not in Christ are condemned already. That's what you have in John in John chapter 3, right after John 3, 316. Now, what does Paul mean when he says that there, is, that there is no condemnation? What he is going to do now in verses 2 and 3 is to show how that is going to, to 
explain that further. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the, in the, in the flesh. Now, Paul says here that, uh, that the law, the uh, law of sin and death, has been broken. Uh, there is a law of sin. Sin leads to death and leads to condemnation. That law has been broken. We have been set free. We have been set free by the Holy Spirit. And he refers here to the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life has set us free, set you free from the law of sin and death. Your justification is followed by sanctification. Now, this is not just the truth that justification should be followed by sanctification. Justification is always followed by sanctification. Remember what we said in Romans 1, 16, that, uh, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? It is salvation from the condemnation of sin, justification, but it is also salvation from the power of sin, sanctification. And you do not have one without the other. Now, notice in verse 2 how the Holy Spirit ref is referred to. He is called the Spirit of life. It is the Spirit of life that has set us free. What is the life that we have in us? It is the life of the Holy Spirit. And that is the life of God, and that is the power of God that we have in us. Now, when Paul says, notice how he refers to the work of the Holy Spirit. He says that the law of the Spirit of life. Now, this is not referring to a law system like commandments. Do this and don't do this. Um, this is referring to uh, something that is more like a law of nature. A law of nature describes how things work. You know, when you refer to the law of gravity, what are you referring to? You're referring to how things work. Uh, our judicial laws um, are really like commandments. Do this, and uh, this is what you should do, and you're commanded to do. You may and you may not do them. You can break uh, judicial laws. You try to break the law of gravity. What's going to happen? Law of gravity is still going still to work, and you may suffer, suffer the consequences. Paul is talking about the law of the spirit of life. He's talking about what the Holy Spirit does and accomplishes in us. He is working on, uh, in us right now, and he will ultimately complete that work. This is a law. He will ultimately complete that work, and he's going to describe this in, uh, in verses 29 and 30 when he says that he is going to make us conformed to the image of Christ, and we are going to be glorified. That's going to happen if you are a believer, if the Holy Spirit is within you. Now, the Holy Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Now, it says that the Holy Spirit has done this, but this is not going to be completely true until we are 
glorified. And so there is a future aspect of this as far as its ultimate com a, a, it accomplishment. There's a present sense also in which we do have uh, a freedom from sin. Uh, and we are not under the dominion of sin. But this freedom from sin is not sinless perfection. Okay, now verse 3, what's the connecting word? For. What is the statement, or what is the basis for saying that the law of the Holy Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death? For, he says, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. It's because of what Christ did, what God did by sending his son, son who condemned sin in the flesh. That is the basis for saying that the law of the spirit of life has set us free. This is the reason why there is no condemnation and why we are freed from the power of sin. What is it? It's because of what Christ has done. It's the work of Christ. The work of Christ is the basis for our freedom. Whether it's the freedom from the past guilt of sin or whether it is freedom from the present power of sin. The work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification is based upon the work of Christ. For what the law could not do. What could not the law do? Couldn't save us? More than that. The law could not produce righteousness. The law could not produce righteousness. It could not save us. It could condemn us, but it could not save us. Now, what's the problem with the law? Why was the law, why is the law so ineffective? What does Paul say? The law is weak. Why is it weak? Huh? Our sinful nature. What does he say? It is weak through the flesh. The problem was not with the law. What did we see in chapter 7? What did, how did Paul describe the law? Never forget this. The law is three things. Huh? Good. That's one of them. Holy and righteous. He says the law is holy and righteous and good. That's the law. There's no problem with the law. The law is a perfect reflection of the standard, a perfect reflection of the righteousness of God. The problem is what is not with the law. The problem is the weakness of the flesh, the weakness of our sinful nature. It's the weakness of the material that the law had to work with. Somebody said that Rembrandt would never have been able to paint a masterpiece if he had to paint it on toilet paper. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's so thin and, and fragile. Well. That's us. That's us. We are, we are weak through the flesh. What is God's solution? What is God's solution? You notice this verse? God's solution to the problem of our inability to be saved through the law because of not the standard being imperfect, but us being too weak. God's solution was what? Huh? Christ. Christ. What does it say? He sent his own son. 
in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. Now that is a, a very important statement. It's a very important statement theology, um, theologically. The solution is God's work in sending his own son. But notice how Christ is referred to here. Who did God send? Who did he send? His own son. Now you notice he was already the son of God when God sent him. He didn't become the son of God by the Incarnation. He did not become the Son of God when He was, was here on the earth. He was already the Son when God sent Him. And so, here we have a, fa the, a reference to the fact that from all eternity, He was the Son of God. This is a reference to the deity of Christ. He is the eternal Son of God. But you notice there is also state, a statement about the humanity of Christ. What does Paul say? In the likeness of sinful flesh. God sent His Son, the eternal Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh flesh. Now that's a very carefully worded statement. You notice he doesn't say God sent his son in the likeness of flesh. Uh, he does not say that God sent his son and he came into the world and he he looked like a man. That is a heresy. That was one of the first heresies in the early church. What heresy was that? That is, was the heresy of docetism. The Greek word dokeo means to seem. And that was the heresy that said that Jesus seemed to be a man. He seemed to be a man, but he really was not a true human being. That was one of the Gnostic heresies. Now, it's interesting. That was the first Christological heresy. When you look at heresies today that relate to the person of Christ, uh, what is the heresy that is most prominent today when people look at Christ? Just a man. What do they deny? His deity. We have to defend the deity of Christ. The first heresy that related to the person of Christ had to do with his humanity. The, the Gnostics, the Docetists, said that he was not really a, a true human being. He just seemed to be a human being. Now, which heresy is worse? The denial of his deity or the denial of his humanity? Huh? Both. We've got a theologian back there. Uh, that is correct. That is correct. For Christ to be our Savior, he must be both God and man. If he is not God, then what he did on the cry cross is not of sufficient worth and value to save us. And if he is not truly man, then he could not take our place, die for us, be our representative there on the cross. The writer of Hebrews said, that uh, he didn't become an angel. And uh, God did not send him to redeem angels. He became a man that he might redeem us. 
So both the deity and humanity of Christ are essential. He does not say he came in the likeness of flesh. Uh, it says that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, you notice also, it does not say that he came in sinful flesh. It does not say that he assumed our sinful human nature. There are a lot of theologians that are, that are saying that today. They are saying that Christ, when he came into this world, took our nature upon himself, and since we are all sinful, that he must have taken upon himself our sinful humanity. The Bible never says that. The Bible says that he, he did no sin, he knew no sin, and sin was not in him. He did not come in, the like, in, in sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful, sinful flesh. Uh, he was like us in our genuine human nature. But it was a perfect humanity, not a sinful humanity, that he came and, and, and assumed. And so... It was this person, the God-man, the perfect God-man. What did he do? He condemned sin in the flesh. And so, in Christ's work, we have a judgment against sin and a judgment against the right of sin to have dominion over us. That's what we had in chapter 6. And he did that. Now notice, what are the connecting words in verse 4? In order that. What does that indicate? What idea does, do the words in order that, in order that indicate? Purpose. Purpose. He condemned sin in the flesh. For what purpose? Now, you remember what Paul said in, verse, in, chapter, in chapter 6? You are not under law, but under grace. And uh, we have been freed from the law. Now, the purpose of our being freed from the law and the purpose of our being uh, not under law, but under grace is not to live a lawless life. But the purpose is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, uh, we are not under the law, but there is no contradiction between life in the Spirit and the keeping of the law. Paul says that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. Now, what did we remember what we said about the law? The law is a reflection of the righteous character of God. Now, there are some, the law, the, the, there are a number of different laws in the Old Testament. There are some laws that are based upon the nature the eternal nature of God in the Old Testament. When you have a law against, uh, against uh, uh, worshiping other gods, when you have a law against making idols, when you have a law against lying, why, why, why are we not to lie? Because God cannot lie. That's, that's, that's his nature. Those are laws that are based upon the nature of God. There are other laws that are found in the Mosaic Law that were really meant to be pedagogical. There are, you know, there, there, were, there were laws that said you cannot eat this food. This food is unclean. You can't eat this food. Now, is that food inherently unclean? In the New Testament, Paul says that 
that uh, whatever we give thanks for, we can eat because it's, it's, it's God's food, you know, and we're not under the law, so we can, we can it's not inherent. What God was trying to do was teach that principle of the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. Uh, there are, were some commandments that were, were more arbitrary. You know what a parent says? Uh, do this. And the flippant teenager says, why should I do it? And the parent says, because I said so. <laughs> Why do I see from your faces that you've all heard that, <laughs> that reason? Well, you know, there are some things that God commanded and, are needed, and, and we need to obey. Man needs to obey just because he said so. When he said to Adam and Eve, not to eat of the tree of the, of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, was, you know, was that a moral issue? Like lying? Rather, that was just the commandment of God. Obey that. Why? Because I said so. So there are different kinds of laws. Now, when it says here that we uh, who walk according to the Spirit, what do we do? We fulfill what? The righteous requirement of the law. We fulfill the righteousness of the law. That doesn't mean that, that we obey every one of the legal commandments of the Mosaic law. We do not obey those ceremonial laws that have been fulfilled in Christ. We do not obey the, the arbitrary kind of commandments or the pedagogical kind of, of commandments. We do obey the righteous requirements of law. All of those laws that are based upon the, the holy character and eternal will of, of God. We do obey those laws. And so Paul says that the Spirit, uh, God, God sent his Son to condemn sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So the Christian life is not the life of trying to, to obey an external code of laws that is imposed upon us. It is the life of a person, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, producing his fruit within us. Uh, he produces his graces in us as they are seen in a life in Christ. So, it is Christ's work in verse 3 that leads to the holiness of life through the Holy Spirit in verse 4. And so the whole goal of the incarnation and death and resurrection of Christ is that we might live holy lives. Okay, so you see here, now I've just said that it is the work of the Holy Spirit who produces that fruit in us. Now you notice how I've described the Christian life? That describes the Christian life from the divine side, right? Your question earlier was, where do we fit in? Now do you notice what Paul, the expression that Paul uses here? but we walk according to the Spirit. That word walk, that word walk, looks at the human aspect of things. 
you know, we are not, you know, we are not robots. You know, we are not mechanical objects. We are not computers that are just being, being programmed and everything. We are really walking. We are really walking. There is a human side for the, for the Christian life. We have to yield to the Spirit. We have to, chapter 6, reckon ourselves to be dead to sin. We yield to the Spirit. We, uh, <coughs> we seek to please God and everything like that. But we do not do that in our own strength. We do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. So there is a, there is a connection. And so, you know, you, you really, you do not have the one-sided uh, human resolutions, human trying harder. You do not have just uh, let go and let God uh, just you know, be a passive kind of object where the Holy Spirit is, is, uh, is, uh, is producing your words and producing your actions and things like that. There is really uh, a walk, and walk involves one st each, each step of the Christian life, that we are walking, but it is in the, in the power of the, of the Holy Spirit.